I am David Murdoch. I am the lead on Ganache at Truffle. And this here is Nick Paterno. Yep. Um, blockchain Ganache. engine or engineer. I uh, couldn't fit it in the slide, so it's shortened. Um, I work on Ganache and Truffle Teams. Yep. So if um, you have Ganache questions, we are the, the people at Truffle to ask. Uh, let me move this a little closer. So you all probably know who Truffle is. I don't imagine it's new to anyone. Um, but if you don't, so Truffle is a company whose goal is to build tools to get developers from idea to dApp as comfortably as possible. Um, so I think sums up our, our uh, goal pretty well. Um, so we have three, kind of four, but uh, three main open source tools. Uh, so one is Truffle, um, which is a dev environment testing framework and asset pip pipeline for blockchains. Uh, Drizzle is a front end library for dApps. And then of course, Ganache, which is your one click blockchain. Um, so what is Ganache? Uh, so Ganache actually comes in three variants. And uh, most people think of Ganache as the UI. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, like, do you, I, who's here? Uh, it, nah. Who is aware of UI and CLI and core? So who hasn't heard of one of those things? Which one? Core. Core, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, actually, I don't know core. Okay, so core, um, <coughs> core is the part of Ganache that does all of the heavy lifting. Um, and so uh, Ganache core is a separate NPM project that um, CLI actually just wraps around. Um, so if you do like a, a require Ganache Core in your project, then you will get the provider and the server that CLI give you and you can uh, access it through programmatic access uh, rather than on the CLI. So this is what uh, Ganache UI looks like. Um, this is the main account screen uh, that starts up. You get uh, 10 accounts by default. Um, you have a, a mnemonic. Don't put that on uh, mainnet, please. Um, it, it, yeah, just assume that your computer is compromised. Don't put that on mainnet. Um, please, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, Truffle contract integration. So if you have uh, a Truffle project, you can add that to Ganache UI, and you can actually see all of your deployed uh, to your local testnet Ganache uh, contracts there, how many transactions there are, etc. Right, pretty useful. And new, as of yesterday, uh, we have Ganache forking. Does anyone know what Ganache forking is? Nobody. All right, that's fine. What about Ganache C Alive and, and Fork Mode? Has anyone seen that? You do? You're right. Okay. You, all right, you come up and teach. All right. <laughs> oh, good. Um, so Ganache Forking is a really hidden feature of Ganache. Uh, it's now in, now in UI. And the alpha version, you guys can download it. Let me know if it, if it breaks or not. Um, I, I literally published it yesterday, so uh, might not might not be too stable. Uh, but Ganache Forking lets you... Uh, I'll just read it, Easily, easy mainnet testing without the cost. So what that means is inside of Ganache UI, you can now select mainnet, um, like from Infura as a provider, uh, or you can put your own provider in. And Ganache will then fork at a specific block number that you specify or latest. And so when you start up Ganache, you will actually get instantly, well, a couple seconds, these are, these are mainnet block numbers right here, and the dates that they were mined, um, and the gas used for them, and all of the transactions are here without syncing. And additionally, when you now run uh, your uh, contracts against your local ganache, it actually emulates being on mainnet. Does that cover it? Does that, does that sound good? Yep, so, so risk-free. No cost, so you can deploy your contracts to mainnet using uh, other contracts that are deployed on mainnet. So sorry, uh, to Ganache UI like it was on mainnet. So it's um, like fully emulating mainnet. So it's like you fork 
right at this lock number uh, here, the four o'clock, and uh, all the data that is on mainnet is now available to your contracts on your local machine. Pretty great feature. Any new transactions will then go on the fork, so you're sort of risk-free uh, access, and then if you had sort of to access say, some state or data that was previously on the chain, we'll just request it from your provider. Questions for that? So how do you get you this small data to come? Because you do initialize it, do you initialize a new account and overwrite it all? Yeah, so we actually just, so, so the, the accounts that you uh, saw a couple slides back, um, so you actually, uh, the way that works is we just lie to the state and we just say each of these has 100 ETH. Um, that, so that's just the default. And so we do the same thing with forking. As soon as we fork, the very next block number is an empty block that basically just changes the state. We just kind of force it to happen. Yeah. Uh, in addition, on that note, actually, we also allow you to sort of um, pretend to be any account that you want. So if you want it to be uh, uh, issue transactions on behalf of an account that you yeah, have. You, you, have you can be account zero if you wanted. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, fun stuff. Yeah. So, so technically, you could use mainnet accounts. Too. Yeah. If right. You don't have the right. So you can you can emulate them. Yeah. So you can unlock those accounts if you wanted to, um, in, in your local instance, um, and, and test for those. Yep. So you can pretend to be the DAO hacker and hack the DAO. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Ethereum development is um, kind of high risk. Actually, earlier today, we burned some ether trying to deploy, uh, and it failed. Um, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't have, but we did. Um, and uh, other issues are your byte code is public, so you, you can't hide your, your source code. So, um, and, you know, you shouldn't use obscurity by obs uh, uh, security by obscurity. But in a way, we all kind of do in uh, normal development. Um, but Ethereum's a little different. Um, all your contracts are public, so anyone can run your software. And it, I think you all know this, but um, uh, meanwhile, the hackers are private and anonymous, and uh, there's no recourse for if your contract gets strained. You don't know who that is, and there's no jurisdiction that can come after those people. Um, so if you mess up, you or your users lose big, it's your recourse. Um, so some key concepts we're gonna go over just real quick. Uh, gas, fallback functions, and re-entrancy. Um, sorry, I can't actually see that slide. Mm -hmm. uh, so to, tra to transact on Ethereum, you must pay a fee. This fee is paid in gas. Uh, gas is paid for in Ether. Operations on Ethereum, uh, like sorting and treating data, transferring funds, uh, math operations, looping, um, all that requires some amount of gas. Uh, generally, if a transaction attempts to use more gas than it is given, the transaction fails and those state changes are persisted. So now fallback functions, these are functions that can execute operations as long as there is enough gas forwarding to it. Um, a fallback function must be external and it is the unnamed function in your contract. Uh, it is called when a contract's address is sent ether, or a non-existent contract function is called. Um, who hasn't heard of fallback functions? Okay. Um, all right, I'll, I'll just won't go through this. Just skip over that. And reentrancy vulnerability. Uh, does anyone know what that is already? You do? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, a couple, couple of you. So this will be fun. Um, so, uh, I don't know, we spent like an hour trying to come up with this uh, line. We tried to get it down to one, but we couldn't. But so the uh, kind of most basic way I can define a reentrancy vulnerability for smart contracts is it's when a contract permits unintended re-invocation of any of its methods after calling an external contract during a single transaction. It was pretty dense. Um, so I'll, I'll say it one more time. When a contract permits unintended re-invocation of any of its methods after calling an external contract during a single transaction. 
Um, so another way of saying it, smart contract reentrancy allows for multiple invocations of a contract methods during a single transaction, usually caused by forwarding excess gas to a malicious contract fallback function without proper reentrancy protection. Um, so that's that's there's a lot to take in there, um, and we're going to get into much more of this. Um, yeah. So a reentrant vulnerability example. Um, does anyone does anyone know actually where the vulnerability is in, in this code? Yeah. Yes, it yeah, so this right here? Yeah. So this line right here is a re-entrancy vulnerability. And the reason for that is sender.call.value will pass all of the remaining gas that's left for this transaction into the sender. Um, and so if sender is a contract and with a fallback function that is payable, then this sender will be able to execute additional transactions after the fallback function is called. And so one of those transactions may be to recall withdraw. And now the problem with that is that this line will execute, I think I have all this uh, set up here. Oh, wait. Hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get there. Where am I? It's good. Too fast, too far. Right? Where's that right? Oh, that's good. Okay. We'll go through this, the, the uh, disclaimer. Uh, volume. Sorry. It's too quiet. <laughs> we'll skip it. All right, so I'll just read the disclaimer. We'll, we'll skip the Jurassic Park scene. Um, so before we get started and I teach you guys how to do this, um, just remember, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Um, the intent of this workshop is to teach you how to protect your contracts. Um, it is not to teach you how to exploit others' contracts. Um, so don't steal, be legal, uh, be nice to people. This is for, for testing your own contracts and, and in a real world scenario. Yeah. Uh, so don't say truffle talking how to uh, steal from people. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so I was getting ahead of myself there. I really wanted to start on this. So uh, this would be uh, an example of a an attacker's contract that they upload in order to be bad. Um, so and this down here is the fallback function. And so we saw that in that contract earlier that it was uh, could be re-entered. And so I'll show you how that works here. So what happens is, um, initially, that one of the cases in the contract is to seed it with some amount of value. Um, and so what it's doing here is it's depositing, let's say, one ether um, into the victim, which is the, the contract we saw just a couple slides ago, into that contract. So they now own that ether as a, their own balance in that contract. Um, so the attacker then would call the B back function, which would then call withdrawal. And now this would all work wonderfully, so this withdrawal would then just withdraw this one value. But because of this hacker being a little bit clever, they implemented this fallback function. And what this function is going to do is after uh, the original contract gets this amount from them, from the uh, the caller the, from this contract here, it'll get their balance and it will record that and then send that amount back to the contract. And at which point the contract will then be able to go into this fallback function and call withdraw again. And so what this then does is re-enters and checks the balance. But we haven't zeroed out the balance yet in the original contract. So this balance is still the full one ether. And so this is the second time we've been here. And so the next line is going to be to call that fallback function again. And so we're back into the bad guy's contract and what are they gonna do? They're gonna withdraw yet again. 
and they can do that as long as they have enough gas. So that's what this little check here is. It just checks the gas to make sure that the transaction won't fail on it. Um, so pretty crazy. Um, happens in the real world. Um, so this is an example of how you would execute this sort of attack using Truffle to run your test. So the attacker would deploy their contract to um, mainnet and execute the attack against the target contract. Uh, so the, all you need to do is run Truffle test. Um, code looks like this. So this is um, sorry, to see. this is how you would deploy. So we're seeding it with the one ether here, um, deploying it there, and executing the attack. And that's it. That's all it would take. All right, so what we've covered so far, uh, truffle, ganache, ganache forking, gas, fallback functions, re-entrancy, the exploit, and a little bit about truffle test. Um, any questions so far? Someone has, has that question. No? Good. All right. <clears throat> Uh, so we've all heard of the DAO hack, um, and the DAO hack was a, a hack that was based on reentrancy. Um, it was a reentrancy vulnerability in this function, right here. So they are, in this function here, they are sending all of the remaining gas to the recipient, and that enabled the recipient to call back into this function. It was actually much more compl complicated than this. There was, uh, several methods that they had to go through and um, kind of configure in order to get this payout to be called again. But this is how they did it. Any questions on, on that? I'll leave, it, I'll, I'll leave it open for a second. All right. Well, questions? Anyone have any? We're good? Can I skip a slide? Okay. Good. Cool. Um, so there's a bunch of ways to do reentrancy protection in your con uh, your contracts and your methods. Um, so one is this thing called the check effects interaction pattern. And so where first you do a check, so you see that their balance is greater than zero, for instance. And then you perform the effect that an interaction will have. Um, so this is, you zero out the balance before you send it, which is what you were saying earlier. Um, and then once you do the effect, then you finally run the interaction. Um, another way is using locking or mutex, um, or open that ones like reentry and guard. And this basically is, you have a Boolean value, you can call it lock or, or whatever you want, which uh, would be true, uh, false. And so when you come in here the first time, uh, this requires them will pass. And then you would immediately lock it. So now if anything happens when you do the things, uh, this condition will fail because lock is now true. Um, and then when you're done, just make sure that you unlock your contract. If you don't, if there's an error and this lock doesn't unlock, then you can effectively lock your contract, um, preventing you from interacting with it even. Okay, got ahead of myself. Uh, and this is really important. Um, who has heard of address send and address transfer and why those were added? Or one of the reasons why? Does anyone know? So these were added because of the address that call sending all of the remaining gas by default. Um, and so that was seen as a vulnerability um, and that it wasn't clear that that would enable re -entrancy. And so what they did is they came up with address send and address transfer, which will automatically limit the amount of gas that's passed to 2300-ish. Um, it's complicated, but um, what that did was effectively make it so that it was too expensive to do anything in a fallback function that could possibly result in re -entrancy. And so now 
if you use address sender or address set transfer um, and to send that ether, the fallback function would be stuck there. It wouldn't be able to get back out and in, into your, con your contract, which sounds great. It sounds like that would fix everything. Um, and it did, but uh, the problem was, I went two slides again, Constantinople. Everyone, everyone knows about Constantinople, I'm guessing. It's, um, it's great. So Constantinople had an EIP that actually lowered the minimum gas cost for storage from 5,000 to 200 gas. In certain situations. Right, ish. Um, again, it's complicated. Um, so when that would happen, fallback functions could now call back in and perform re-entrancy because of Constantinople. And we only caught this a couple days before it was going to go live, which is crazy. Um, so, well, luckily we caught it. Um, it was removed and um, never made it to mainnet, also ish. Because um, it actually is active on mainnet, which is a uh, fun fact. Um, and then there's Istanbul. So, uh, Istanbul's increased gas costs actually kind of do the opposite um, as Constantinople's uh, decreases we're doing and that there are now functions on live contracts that cannot, that will no longer work. So this is actually uh, copy pasted from a contract that uh, will be fixed before incident Istanbul goes live. But these three parts, um, or specifically the total, that would actually do like two S loads or one S load. Um, and because of increased costs in the S loads and uh, a, a couple of other opcodes, this will now fail every single time. There's no way for this to pass under Istanbul. Um, so the point being that you cannot rely on gas costs to protect against re um, So just remember that. That's the only thing. Just always be aware of that. So the honeypot. Honeypot is fun. Um, has anyone heard of a honeypot in like uh, InfoSec? Yeah, so uh, honeypots and infosec are actually a little bit different than what we call honeypots in Ethereum, but we're gonna we're gonna keep calling it honeypot um, because uh, that's just we name things the way we want. <laughs> anyway, I think. Um, so a honeypot is uh, a way to trick the bad guy into becoming a victim. Um, and I I forgot I wanted to time that. So uh, there are several types of honeypots, and this is you. you. You can go. You can go for this. Uh, sure. There are three different sort of uh, general types, actually, that are really well laid out uh, at a PDF here that you can find at this link. Um, but ge in general, the sort of uh, taxonomy of pot uh, honeypots are there are three main classes. You have a class of, of honeypots that uh, interact with the Ethereum virtual machine, some that um, happen during compilation, and some that are actually um, just due to misleading or missing information on uh, a block explorer. Uh, so again, for example, like uh, EVM is actually just a well-defined uh, set of rules, and um, everyone should be sort of, or is, has access to those rules. However, given the implementation of some contracts, they could look sort of non-intuitive, and therefore uh, would be able to trick you. Um, some some uh, bugs actually exist in the Solidity compiler. Um, they're actually usually very well documented, uh, but there can be some that have, have not been discovered yet or that um, are sort of zero day still. And then, for example, um, you have some things in blockchain explorers, for example, like uh, there was a time where Etherscan only showed you 80 characters wide, and if you were to upload a contract that had something outside of that, you wouldn't be able to see, say, that there was a send or, or a transfer or something. So that's the general gist, and we'll go into some of these later. So this next slide is fun, but you're not going to be able to hear it. So just load the slides up. Um, oh, some people came in uh, just now. So make sure you go to these slides at shuffle.co slash Um So this next one slide I'm going to skip over, but it's fun, and I spent too much time on it, so you guys should uh, uh, just check it out. <laughs> just tell me if you liked it. We'll go ahead and skip. <laughs> so, 
the trace buster buster. Anyway, so so far we've covered truffle, ganache, ganache forking, gas, fallback functions, reentrancy, exploit, testing, and the DAO, Constantinople and its Istanbul uh, reentrancy protection, and honeypots. Questions about any of that? Yes? Uh, do you remember the, the difference something about if the way it fails, right? Um, if, if I recall correctly, it's, I, I believe it's what, what is passed along as your message.sender and like sort of like the context of who's mm -hmm. calling, or is that the call? Yeah, I, so I think it is just the way that it fails. Um, there's actually a really excellent answer for it on Stack Overflow. I just can't remember uh, which one does what. Um, but I'm going to double check. Okay. Yeah. Any other, any other questions? Send latency of boolean. So if the transfer is send latency of boolean flash, or if it can do something, you can transfer directly reverse an exception. Okay, so send will return a boolean. Yes, it worked, or no, it didn't. And then transfer will. Exception okay, so like revert. Okay, there we go. I, sorry, uh, I, I didn't get the part about honeypot. So honeypot is is it the contract that you deploy that you get? Right. Yeah. So a uh, honeypot is kind of like an idea. So it's like um, you can have like lots of different types of honeypots. Um, so in infosec, it would be called like a mousetrap. Um, so like a, a honeypot in InfoSec is just like a deterrent, like, um, or, or a way to learn about your attacker. So you set up a, a network that looks open and see what the attacker does and what they try. That way you can learn from them. Um, so an InfoSec uh, mousetrap is um, a way of trying to convince the attacker to come into your network and give something up um, somehow. And that way you can catch them and win that way. Um, so we're actually so in Ethereum, everyone calls uh, a honeypot or a, a mousetrap a honeypot. So a honeypot is a contract that fools somebody, an attacker, into giving something up, um, and usually that's going to be ether. So, so yeah, tra transfer throws and send returns false, not a failure. All right. So workshop time. We're going to take all of that and we're we're going to exploit or attempt to exploit a known honeypot on mainnet. And so, uh, as an overview, what we'll be doing is uh, taking the code that we see on Etherscan, so that this, this uh, person that uploaded this contract, maybe it's one of you, you don't know, um, they uploaded their contract code to Etherscan, except it wasn't their contract code. So even though Etherscan can verify that's right by code, there's some tricks in there that make it actually behave differently than what you see in the code. Um, and so we're going to see how, uh, if you just wanted to exploit this because you're a bad guy and you wanted to steal the Ether that was stored in the contract, it would fail. And so we're going to do that. We're going to we're going to run this and we're going to run it locally in Ganache, and we're going to see that it fails. And then we're going to run it locally in Ganache with forking enabled off of mainnet. And the conference Wi-Fi is a little rough, but we're going to try anyway. Um, and yeah, it'll be fun. Um, so everyone needs to go to workshop. We'll just get to this slide. Uh, make sure you're on, uh, you download Node.js. I just put 10 there. It should work on 8. It will likely work on 12. Um, I found a lot of uh, Ethereum tooling doesn't work well on V12. Um, if you want to use UIs because you're more comfortable in the UI, then down, try to download Ganache UI Alpha. Um, I can also try to set up, I, I have all the versions for Mac, Windows, and Linux on my laptop, and so I can give you links to try to download them direct from my laptop network um, if, if we have to. Or install Ganache CLI, um, and you can make sure you use the global flag here. Um, if anyone needs help with Node or NPM, uh, let us know. Um, and then you will want to clone this link. So that's where come, going to this website will help. You'll be able to get this link pretty easily. Um, so clone this. If you need help with that, let us know. Um, and then run npm install in here. And again, it's a workshop. So ask your neighbor, ask us, and we'll help you.
David Clark. Not David Clark. Yeah. Um, yeah.